Hello, Ed, and welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. Or should I call you Edward? Which do you no, prefer? Ed, Ed is fine. Thank you. How are you doing today, Melissa? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for Great. asking. Ed, I can't wait to get into your story. It's so compelling. And I know a lot of people aren't adopted. Some are. But chances are we do know folks who have been adopted or who have a story that they've uncovered through DNA research and ancestry work. So I'm so thrilled to hear your story. Yeah. So I how would you like to start? Would you like to tell us about the book or? Well, sure. You know, it's like, I'll tell you a little bit about the story that led to the book. Uh, you know, I went through a good part of my life knowing I was adopted, but, but never pursuing anything about it. My adoptive parents gave me a, a quite wonderful life. And yeah, they were the only parents I ever knew and really ever was concerned with. Uh, but somewhere around my 69th birthday, I had the itch to to go and look. And it really came from a brief stop at a, a Russian Orthodox cemetery in New Jersey where my adoptive mother's parents were buried. And we were kind of standing over the, the gravestone. I said, I would really like to know more about them. And I went to our local library, got on Ancestry.com, and, you know, wound up with a lot of information coming to me. And I sat there and I thought, well, if it's this easy to get information for them, I bet it wouldn't be that hard to find information about the woman who had placed me for adoption at the time that I was born. And that's where this journey kicked off. That's fascinating. So you were 69 when this all transpired. Yes, they call that my late adulthood. It's, you know, some people are wondering from the time that they're conscious of all of this. Uh, some kind of just felt it and never look. And I, the time came and it was right and, and off I went. Yeah, it sounds like that the resources were there and the information were there that the time was perfect to dig in. I was, yeah, I was very fortunate. My adoption was privately arranged. So contrary to many people who have no clue or or no easy starting point, I had a piece of paper which was in, in fact was the um, declaration of my adoption. It mm -hmm. contained my adoptive parents' name the name of their attorney for, and for some reason, I knew that name, I recognized it. And one other name I didn't recognize, I did not recognize, but common sense told me, yeah, that's your mother. So I, I went back to the library with that name, plugged it into the computer and, and all sorts of information came back to me. So walk us through this. Walk us through your discovery and what you found and what lessons you've taken from all of this. Well, you know, I, I went into this largely expecting that I would, I, I was born in 1948, and that was in the midst of what was known as the baby scoop era. And in the baby scoop era, if, I, if a woman was unmarried and became pregnant, Typically, they were sent off somewhere, uh, typically to avoid shame for their family. And, you know, it was, well, yeah, you know, Mary has gone to Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Susan's house, spent some time. But, mm -hmm. you know, they would have the baby and the baby would be taken from them. And the girl would then return home. And I, I the greatest part of my belief was that that's where I came from. And I expected that my birth mother had been a high school girl who unexpectedly became pregnant and, and, and went through that, you know, that experience. But when I went back to the library and put her name into the computer, and I found lots of information, two, two full screens, and a lot of it was 
were census records, things like that, that anybody typically would have. But the one that I settled on and I, I said, we'll click this one first was a visa application to travel from Miami, Florida to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, 10 months after my birth. Oh, wow. And they said, okay, that's not something your typical high school girl would be doing. So I Go clicked on, on that one and I, I got a picture of that application with my mother's photograph attached to it. And what it told me was that my mother had been 23, had been 23 years old at the time of my birth. So certainly no longer a high school girl. It gave some information as to who her parents were and where she lived. And, and I, I pretty much had figured that out by then, but it then listed her profession. And this application was, was printed in Portuguese hmm. and it listed her um, occupation, you know, profeseo as artista. So that, yeah, that led me to wonder what kind of artista. And yeah, I, I say in the book, had I, had I opened these documents and found out that she was, a, you know, the high school girl, that would have been the end of the story. I would have satisfied my curiosity. But when I found that, yeah, it just made me that much more curious. Well, and, sure. Yeah. And I just kept on digging from there, found more and more and more. I think the next document that I opened up was was a marriage license for her seven years after I was born. So I was, I was the result of a summer romance and an unexpected arrival. And I found her, found the license with her name on it, her birth name, what ultimately was a stage name and then her husband's name. So it gave me more to search with. And I, I, I did a Google search with her first name and his last name. And I found a, a blog from an antique dealer in South Carolina who had been in an auction and bought a number of items that had gone to auction that had been created by my mother and her then husband. And it explained that the two of them had been ice skaters in the big ice skating shows and then yeah. moved on to become a or to create a company that that created props for the ice shows for theatrical events and and other commercial endeavors. So with that, I you know I went back into Google again. You know, Google's our friend, and typed in my mother's name was Genevieve Narowski. That was her that was her birth name, but I took the her husband's name put in Genevieve Meza and didn't get back anything very revealing. But then I put in Genevieve Norris, which was the stage name that she had adopted. And I mm -hmm. believe I put in Genevieve Norris performer because that was the occupation listed on the marriage license and came up with another antique stealers blog. And this blog though had probably half a dozen photographs of my mother that were taken to, for use in promotional purposes and then a copy of her middle school diploma and a copy of her first professional contract and explained that this, this antique dealer had, had been at the same auction, found a little box of, of memorabilia and not knowing who my mother was, knowing nothing about ice skating, just thought glamorous woman, yeah, you know, glamorous profession. Let me buy the box of stuff. And I'm sure it was very inexpensive at that point, but you know, it was gold to me. Sure. So I I I managed to message the the antiques dealer. They were pickers, she and her husband and and their specialty was buying small items that they could resell. Mm -hmm. And this auction had taken five years had taken place five years prior. So I messaged her and um, the approach I was taking as I did my research was I was exploring a possible family relationship. I mm. didn't want to make it too specific. And I messaged and, you know, very, very quickly I got a response from her. And she said, yes, I still have this. We haven't sold any of it. 
Wow. And she said, but I'm really busy. Can I get back to you? And I, I, I had no choice there. I said, I'll, I'll wait to hear from you. And it took about a week or so. And I didn't hear anything back. So I, I got a little bit more impatient, a little bit more pressing. And I, I messaged her again and I said, you know, I haven't heard from you, but would you please call me? The information you have is from my birth mother. And I explained my adoption. And within five minutes, she called me and hmm. she apologized. I just totally forgot about it, but you need to come here right now. And we were in North Carolina. Oh. Yes, yeah, she was in Georgia. And about a week or so later, we went to visit with her and with her husband, and and they brought this carton of, of materials and a couple of other small items that were were props that my mother and her husband had had created for one of the shows. And we went through that carton, and it was just a treasure trove there. <sighs> and on the, yeah, we were you know we we had my wife and I as we drove down, we're kind of debating. You know, what is this really worth financially to us or what, it, you know, what's its value? And at, at one point I was sort of making notes as we were going through these materials down there and, and the husband said, what are you doing? And I explained, I said, you know, well, these, these photographs all have other people's names. And maybe if I could track down those names, somebody would remember my mother. And he said, you don't need to do that. He said, we just said, this, bo this box belongs to you. He said, we've been holding it for you. And they just kind of pushed it across the table at me. Mm. And, you know, and that's, that was a great, great gift. And it was a very generous act on their part. Absolutely. I, yeah. I love how this is all coming together. And I have so many questions, so many things yeah, I want to know. Yeah, the story has been a series of of kind of serendipitous events and generous people. Huh? And that's just one piece is kind of, kind of tied to the next. And it just, it kept on revealing itself. So tell us more. What happened then? Well, it was kind of interesting. You know, there were a, a stack of photographs of other ice skaters and each one was signed and some of them had notes on them and and I said, okay, well, I can go through this stack and I'll look for these people. And remember, yeah, these were women who were probably in their 20s in 1947. Sure. So I, 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 I did it with some, I did it ambitiously, but with minimal expectations. And I went through that pile and I sent some of the women's information. They were deceased. Some of them I couldn't find at all. I got to the last photograph and it was a, a woman, Isabel Smith, and she signed it, you know, love Izzy to the best roommate ever. Mm. And I'm thinking, okay, if she was my mother's roommate, she'd know stuff. Because Absolutely. At that, that point, I was kind of curious about who my father had been and I had never been before. You know, when I was, when I was thinking, she had, yeah, my mother had been a high school girl, I thought the father was probably a guy who worked at the gas station. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I, I, I became more curious. I researched Isabel and what I found was a, an obituary for her husband. But, you know, in the obituary it listed two sons and said survived by Isabel, his wife of 58 years, mm -hmm. a 20 year veteran of, of, Ice Follies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I knew by that time she had been a pro professional ice skater. So I reached out to one of the sons because I couldn't find the mother. And I sent a picture of my mother. I sent the picture of his mother. And about a week later, he called me back and he was very enthusiastic. And he said, I showed those pictures to my mother. He wants to talk to you. She were, yeah, she would like to talk with you. And I said, that's great. So he started giving me contact information. He said, but let me just give you one caution. He said, mom is in a memory care facility. Hmm. And, he, and he must have heard me sort of deflate at that point. He said, but yeah, he said, the good news is, yeah, she can't remember what she had for breakfast, but she knows everything minute for minute about 1947. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So I called, I called Isabel and she was quite a character. 
<laughs> it was, um, I, I started, I, I kind of apologize. This, I calculated she must be about 92 at that point. So I said, I know it's really not fair to ask somebody who's 92 to tell me about what happened in, in 1947. And you could sort of feel her, you know, sense her puff up, said, who told you I'm 92? <laughs> I love I her. I didn't say anything. She said, I'm 88. And I quickly uh, did the math. I said, she would have been 12 <laughs> years old. She said, as a matter of fact, I'm 85. So we, <laughs> we had the, we had a great conversation. Yeah. You know, and she, she told me lots of things. She basically though said, I really don't know who your mother dated. I don't know who your father was, but you know, we, we talked probably the better part of an hour. And at the end of the conversation, there was a pause. She said, now, how old did you say you are? And I said, well, I'm 69. She said, well, I'm 65, you know. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of cute. And probably yeah. I talked to her in June. In September, my wife and I visited with her outside of Minneapolis at the facility. And we spent four hours with her one afternoon. And we had just a lovely time. And, and she kept on saying, this is the best time I've had in years. Oh, and the one cute thing she told us, or it's very interesting, was that, you know, she and my mother were skating with ice follies. It was Shipstead and Johnson's ice follies, and the Shipsteads and Oscar Johnson owned the show. And she said they were very, very protective. They were very strict about, you know, where the skaters went and with whom. She said the only time they kind of let down their guard guard was when I was dating Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. I said, excuse me. And the show, you know, they they would spend the summer in San Francisco rehearsing and performing. And then they would kick off the season in Los Angeles every September. And it was a major media event then. Uh, the show was actually broadcast on national radio. All the stars uh -huh. would show up. And, and Ronald Reagan took a liking to Isabel. So that was a, you know, it was just the cutest side there. Absolutely. So what did you yeah. learn about your mom from Isabel? Well, you know, she, kind of personality thing. She said, you know, your mother was, was very quiet. She was very thoughtful. She was very kind. And that's why he always tried to sit next to her in the dressing room. And she implied that she was probably my mother at 23 or 22 at that point was a bit more mature than the majority of the skaters. They were, they were younger girls. She said, so she, yeah, she said to the wonderful roommate, she said, if she was pregnant, I can't, can't imagine she did what she did on ice with you and her belly. Because my wow. mother was what they called an adagio skater. And it's, it's kind of a contradiction in terms in that, in that music in music, adagio usually means slow. Mm -hmm. And adagio skaters on ice are, uh, you yeah, know, they're, they're, they border on the edge of suicidal, you know, that's very acrobatic dancing and skating. So wow. you know, what my, my feeling is that, you know, my mother didn't know she was pregnant at the time. Sure. You know, so she had left San Francisco unexpectedly pregnant, not knowing it. Went through the season openers in Los Angeles, probably still not knowing it. And on the way to Chicago, probably said something's up here. And when she reached, reached Chicago, she called home and she made contact with her eldest sister, who was 12 years older than she was, and basically said, don't say anything to anybody. I think I'm pregnant. Can you help me? And her eldest sister was... Um, married to a man who was a little bit older, still older than she was. And he was, uh, he was in the production of training films in New York city, but he had been in the office of war information during the second world war and was rather connected around New York city. And the, the deal was when the show gets to New York, Charles will take you to see someone and you can find out, yes, are you pregnant or not? And if you are, what are you going to do? But the mm -hmm. deal was, we will not tell mama. We will not tell daddy. Mm -hmm. yeah, because that was a conservative sure. Polish Roman Catholic family. You know, her parents were first generation 
immigrants, and that would have been a very disgraceful thing in its time. Her life would have been much different, for sure. Yeah, it would have been extremely difficult, and that's, you know, and that's the the discomfort, the decision she needed to make when she ultimately found she was pregnant. She was taken to a place called Lexington Hospital, which which within only a couple of years after I was born there ceased to operate as a a hospital. And I guess in, in hotel terms it would be, you know, a boutique facility. It was a small building and it catered to a limited number of of clients and most of those people were in show business or in some way they were prominent public figures. And what it did was it provided medical solutions, but they did it with a great deal of privacy and discretion. So Genevieve was brought there, it was confirmed that she was pregnant and she was offered the options of, you know, well, you can go through with the pre- with the pregnancy and, you know, you can, then she was faced with what do I do with baby and, and what do I do with my career? And, you know, I, she was presented with, you know, the quote unquote black market option of we could terminate your pregnancy. And now we're not recommending this, but you know, if that's something you wanted to do, we could arrange that. That would have been and, very dangerous for her in that day and in that yeah, climate. At that point it was within a medical setting, though it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a back alley option. But she chose to go through with the pregnancy, but then the the uh, what confronted her was, I have a baby. What do I do? Do I go home to my parents in disgrace? And if I do that, how do I support a child? I'm unmarried, and I'm an ice skater. Do I take my baby? Do I put him in a backpack and go on the road with him? And that didn't seem like a good option, even though it sounds since that there were. A, a small handful of families who chose to do just that, you know, and the, the kids grew up, you know, in those backpacks and became skaters when they were four and, and were performing not, not that late after that. And the third option that was presented to her was, you know, you can place your baby for adoption and yeah, put them in the hands of someone, yeah, you know, who can care for them better than you can, hopefully. And then that was the option that she selected. That's an amazing story and it an amazing, it, amazing it turn. For her. <laughs> There's still more. <laughs> well, you know, the, the typical, I think people look at adoption in that era as being handled by social services. You know, you sort of handed over your baby and they took charge and they just kind of found who, you know, the best home they could and hopefully a good one. But my adoption was privately arranged, and Charles, her brother-in-law, as I said, was a reasonably well-connected in the New York City community. And having worked at with the off uh, with the with the Office of War Information, yeah, in very loose terms, he was a spy during the Second World War. He did mm-hmm. some spy work, did a lot of photography, and from the nose cones of fighter planes over battle areas. And in New York City, there was a a studio facility, a big Paramount moving picture studio, and the Army had taken it over for the Signal Corps. Charles had business there. My eventual adoptive parents worked for the Signal Corps, so they were also in the same facility. And whether or not they ever knew or encountered one another is, uh, we don't know, but there was a third party in there, a man by the name of Eddie Sens. And Eddie Sens was probably the most prominent motion picture hairdresser and makeup artist in New York in that era. And he spanned from early 1940s through the, through the 1960s. And he seems to be a party who was, who was known to both Charles, the brother-in-law, and my adoptive parents. And at some point, there had to be a conversation where, yeah, he was aware my adoptive parents would like to adopt a child. 
and another conversation with Charles with, hey, you know anyone looking for a kid? And, sure. and, and the way I've confirmed this is I, I rarely or I never, which is as rarely as you can get, spoken to any <laughs> of my relatives about my adoption. And when I got deeply into this, I called my eldest cousin, who was very, very close with my adoptive parents. And I said, Anne, do you know anything about my adoption? And I kind of expected her to gasp or fall off her chair or something. She never missed a heartbeat. She said, well, I only know two things. One is that your mother was an ice skater. And number two is when your parents went to pick you up, you were a day old and my mother went with them. Mm. So, you know, that was good. I was happy that she confirmed my mother was an ice skater because I had found mm -hmm. someone else with the same name and not too much difference in age. And I kept thinking, okay, you know, I, I want to know right. for sure I got the right person. So that was good. But about, oh, I don't know, two weeks later, she called me back and she said, I thought of one more thing. She said, you were named after Eddie Sands. Mm. I said, why was it named after Eddie said? She said, because he arranged your adoption. So, you know, he was the middleman between Charles on one side and, you know, my adoptive parents on the other. And I, I think the remarkable thing that my mother did, my birth mother did, was she came up with a list of things that she wanted for me. And they... They included, she wanted me baptized. You know, mm -hmm. She came from a Catholic family. She wanted that for me. She wanted parents who didn't have any other children so that I would be special. She wanted people with a, a steady income. My adoptive parents lived in an apartment. She wanted parents who had a, a home with a yard around it. And within months of my adoption, my parents were building a house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there, there are a number of those things. And, and you know, I think, you know, her plan for my adoption was, was something she really thought about. And That's in awesome. the end, I think remarkably achieved it. You know, with the baptized piece, my, my adoptive parents had eloped 10 years prior. For me to be baptized, they needed to be married in the church. Mm -hmm. And shortly after they took me home, they were married in church. And the next day I was baptized. So wow. Things all fell into place for her, for me, for them. And you know, I, I've, I've been thinking since you and I spoke, I've, I've been thinking about the title of your podcast. And mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of uncomfortable, uncomfortable uncomfortability, I guess, when, when adoption is involved, you know, there was the discomfort of her making the decision she did. I think mm -hmm. the discomfort on my adoptive parents' side, because what I learned later is that in New York at the time, if you were adopting, you could not do that until you were approved by social secure, social services and had waited 18 months. And in the interim, I became my parents' foster child. And that just is a, you know, that, that's just a chilling term to me, you know, because it seems so, so transitory or temporary rather than here's, here's your son, you know. And then, then even from my standpoint, you know, I, I, I kind of let into this, you know, lightly and out of curiosity, not knowing what I'd find, but you know, there's still this little piece that says, you know, what if I find something I don't want to know? Mm. Yeah, so that was that was interesting as well. But yeah, you know, it's it's worked out. Could not have worked out much better. When I hear your story, I hear so much love for all the people involved in the story for you, for your mom, from your mom who spent and, and your birth mom to be specific who spent time really thinking about, one, what she was going to do and how she was going to love you in her absence. And she gave you this life. She had this list of what she wanted for you. Uh, Charles, who served as a broker of sorts to he did. arrange this, he took care to find someone worthy of your mother, birth mother's request. Right. When and I then, found... 
I, excuse me. When I sound, I've found and met three maternal first cousins so far. And when I met Charles's son, yeah, he talked extensively about the, the paternal interest he took in my mother. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right on board there. He, you know, he made it his project and his, you know, his concern that things happen properly. You know, Genevieve made the, he made the list, but you know, he went out and he, he beat the bushes and he found the right person or right people. Well, and he found a facility and a place and a medical professional who would care for her and love her. Absolutely. And obviously your adoptive parents, they went to a lot of trouble and a lot of inconvenience to ensure that they and you would have a life together built on something solid. Yeah. That you would have a house and a yard. You would have married parents. You would be baptized. All of these things. Yeah. Just it's interesting with the with this interesting with the story with the house the my adoptive mother's parents lived out on Long Island in New York they owned a big piece of property across the street from them and i could honestly tell you my father did not like going out there had no interest but they locked off a piece of that property and that's where he built the house Hmm. And he was, I could also tell you that as soon as my adoption was finalized, he sold that house. We moved back to New York City, <laughs> you know, so there was another piece that said, you know, that was something that he did for a reason. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he could get out of town, we were out of there. Uh, he also, along with my uncle, my mother's brother, bought a little grocery store around the corner. So that they would have a a source of a steady income. And, you know, my father worked as a, a freelance person. He worked projects. So he, yeah, and he always did quite well. But, you know, his his employment history sort of went in two and three month blocks. And then there would be a gap and then more. So for the purposes of the adoption, they went and they ran this you know, tiny little grocery store for a period of time. They also sold that right about the time the house got sold. But it was, they were all vehicles to accomplish an end, which was to, you know, to bring my adoption to completion. What a beautiful story. And I'm sure there are a lot more details that you have in the book. Can oh, you tell us the some. name of the book? Yeah, the book is called The Gift Best Given. I always have trouble getting it into focus here. And yeah, for folks who are listening on the podcast, if you jump over to YouTube, you can see a look at the cover and a beautiful photograph on the front. But uh, the in, the title again is "The Gift Best Given." That's correct. And if if I could take one step back on that photograph on the cover, I ultimately made contact with my maternal half brother, hmm. and I sent him a letter. And I just found a copy of the letter the other day, and I read through it and. And I understood why he didn't respond to it initially. But when we finally made contact, you know, I told him who I was and, you know, and there's some conversation. He said, well, tell me again, what kind of kin are we? And I said, you know, you and I have the same mother. We have different fathers. And there was a pause and he just continued the conversation. And we probably had three or four episodes like that at different times. And he would ask what kind of kin we are. So we finally went down to meet him in Georgia where where his parents had moved and and he had grown up and and one of the beautiful things my birth mother had done is she kept very elaborate scrapbooks you know during her career showing where she had been who she was with and she labeled every picture Oh wow and they were in chronological order so he brought out this photograph album and Started around 1944 or so, and we we're flipping through. And, and these were the old Kodak Brownie snapshots that she had meticulously labeled. And they were in there. And we, we went from 1944 to 45 to 46. And I knew by that time I had been conceived in San Francisco in August of 1947. You know, I had just done the math and I figured out where he was. 
and he was yeah he was insistent that that my mother and her his father had been somewhere else so as he was on yeah you know, on this 1946 page before he turned the page not knowing what was there you know and I, I said Ted one more time I said we have the same mother we have different fathers your mother our mother was in San Francisco in August of 1947 and he flipped the page and this is the only color photograph that was in that album and it well, is labeled San Francisco California August 1947 and he sort of looked at it took a deep breath and closed up the album put the album away and so I said so would you like a beer so we, we had a beer. We left the conversation as is. The next day, I gave him a copy of my adoption decree with his mother's signature on it. And she had a very distinctive signature. And I knew it. Yeah, I didn't have a doubt. He looked at it. He knew it, but he was not saying anything. And he handed it back and I said, you can keep it. I said, it's, you know, it's a it's just a photocopy and it really has no value. And he did keep it, and later that week, you know, he, he said, well, I showed it to so-and-so. There's somebody he trusted, and I said, well, what did he say? He said, well, he asked me if that's Mama's signature. And there was a pause, and I said, well, what did you say? He said, yeah, that's Mama's signature. What did he say? And he said, well, <laughs> he said, Dad, if that's your Mama's signature, it looks like you've got yourself a brother. And since then, Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, open up another beer. Now he's, he's been <laughs> his gold since, you know. But it, yeah. And in, res in retrospect, I, that's kind of a big revelation. Absolutely. And I had, you know, I thought through the process. I, I unfortunately didn't find my mother still alive. But I had thought if I did, how do I gently present myself, you know, because this is, yeah, maybe the biggest secret she's ever kept and unfortunately she wasn't i kind of stormed into his life mm -hmm. i did it with with explanation but i just i just kind of appeared so you know i, I understand now and it's you know he kept on saying mama would have told me i said i don't think so sure, yeah yeah you know. but yes and his attitude now is well i guess every woman has a secret <laughs> i think i think every everyone. person I was yeah. gonna say, I told myself, I think it's every person's got some secret, mm -hmm. but it's yeah, it's been quite the adventure, and there's you know, it, there's still more out there. I New York City recently, uh, in the past two years, started making certified birth certificates available, and that would mm -hmm. list your parents, yeah, more important information. And like when I got mine, you know. Number one, my mother's name was wrong. And number two, her address was wrong. And number three is her occupation was wrong. And I assume that was done to protect her identity. Again, sure. being the kind of facility okay. was. But the the curious item there is I looked, the doctor who signed the birth certificate, and remember this is 1948, was our next door neighbor in New York City in 1953. Oh, and wow. No idea whatsoever. I know it's not a coincidence. Right. And I've just not been able to track down what that connection was. So again, you know, this, this doctor and either my adoptive parents or Charles or Eddie Sens in the middle had some connection. And I'm, I'm still trying. I've, I've found that doctor's daughter. I've, I'm still sitting waiting for the phone to ring. I sent her a Facebook message, which went ignored. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the few days ago, sent her another lengthy explanation. And, and I don't want anything. I just want to know, you know, do you have any idea where your father was in the 1940s? Just so I could try to find that connection. So there's <laughs> been just continuing adventure here. What a compelling story. And as we close here, what would you tell someone who is in that position of knowing they're adopted and curious and frightened all at the same time, what would you share with them? I, you know, I, I, I have a regret and it's the lesson I would pass on is 
is I didn't ask enough questions of the people who had the answers. And especially, you know, I'm going to be, I'm 74 right now. So most of the people or all of the people who've had those answers are not here anymore. So I think if you have the opportunity, yeah, any kind of secret that you're trying to research, go ahead and ask. And what I learned from the, from the people who did help me is people are generally helpful and they're generally very anxious to share stories. If they know anything, they want to share it. So, you know, don't be afraid to ask the questions. And I, you know, take it from me. I didn't ask them and I regret that now. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. This has been fantastic. And folks, the book is going to be amazing. There's going to be a lot more to the story in the book. And the link to that is in the show notes. So make sure you check the show notes if you're listening to the podcast. Or if you're on YouTube, just scroll down and click the link there and check out this book. Thank you, Ed. Melissa, I enjoyed talking with you. Thanks. Thank you so much.